section two of evolution creatrice by henri bergson translated by arthur mitchell this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter one part two it does not enter into our plan to set down here the proofs of transformism we wish only to explain in a word or two why we shall accept it in the present work as a sufficiently exact and precise expression of the facts actually known the idea of transformism is already in germ in the natural classification of organized beings the naturalist in fact brings together the organisms that are like each other then divides the group into subgroups within which the likeness is still greater and so on all through the operation the characters of the group appear as general themes on which each of the subgroups performs its particular variation now such is just the relation we find in the animal and in the vegetable world between the generator and the generated on the canvas which the ancestor passes on and which his descendants possess in common each puts his own original embroidery true the differences between the descendant and the ancestor are slight and it may be asked whether the same living matter presents enough plasticity to take in turn such different forms as those of a fish a reptile and a bird but to this question observation gives a peremptory answer it shows that up to a certain period in its development the embryo of the bird is hardly distinguishable from that of the reptile and that the individual develops throughout the embryonic life in general a series of transformations comparable to those through which according to the theory of evolution one species passes into another a single cell the result of the combination of two cells male and female accomplishes this work by dividing every day before our eyes the highest forms of life are springing from a very elementary form experience then shows that the most complex has been able to issue from the most simple by way of evolution now has it arisen so as a matter of fact paleontology in spite of the insufficiency of its evidence invites us to believe it has for where it makes out the order of succession of species without any precision this order is just what considerations drawn from embryogeny and comparative anatomy would lead any one to suppose and each new paleontological discovery brings transformism a new confirmation thus the proof drawn from mere observation is ever being strengthened while on the other hand experiment is removing the objections one by one the recent experiments of h de Vries, for instance by showing that important variations can be produced suddenly and transmitted regularly have overthrown some of the greatest difficulties raised by the theory they have enabled us greatly to shorten the time biological evolution seems to demand they also render us less exacting toward paleontology so that all things considered the transformist hypothesis looks more and more like a close approximation to the truth it is not rigorously demonstrable but failing the certainty of theoretical or experimental demonstration there is a probability which is continually growing due to evidence which while coming short of direct proof seems to point persistently in its direction such is the kind of probability that the theory of transformism offers let us admit however that transformism may be wrong let us suppose that species are proved by inference or by experiment to have arisen by a discontinuous process of which today we have no idea would the doctrine be affected in so far as it has a special interest or importance for us classification would probably remain in its broad lines the actual data of embryology would also remain the correspondence between comparative embryogeny and comparative anatomy would remain too therefore biology could and would continue to establish between living forms the same relations and the same kinship as transformism supposes today it would be it is true an ideal kinship and no longer a material affiliation but as the actual data of paleontology would also remain we should still have to admit that it is successively not simultaneously that the forms between which we find an ideal kinship have appeared now the evolutionist theory so far as it has any importance for philosophy requires no more it consists above all in establishing relations of ideal kinship and in maintaining that wherever there is this relation of so to speak logical affiliation between forms there is also a relation of chronological succession between the species in which these forms are materialized both arguments would hold in any case and hence 
an evolution somewhere would still have to be supposed whether in a creative thought in which the ideas of the different species are generated by each other exactly as transformism holds that species themselves are generated on the earth or in a plan of vital organization immanent in nature which gradually works itself out in which the relations of logical and chronological affiliation between pure forms are just those which transformism presents as relations of real affiliation between living individuals or finally in some unknown cause of life which develops its effects as if they generated one another evolution would then simply have been transposed made to pass from the visible to the invisible almost all that transformism tells us today would be preserved open to interpretation in another way will it not therefore be better to stick to the letter of transformism as almost all scientists profess it apart from the question to what extent the theory of evolution describes the facts and to what extent it symbolizes them there is nothing in it that is irreconcilable with the doctrines it has claimed to replace even with that of special creations to which it is usually opposed for this reason we think the language of transformism forces itself now upon all philosophy as the dogmatic affirmation of transformism forces itself upon science but then we must no longer speak of life in general as an abstraction or as a mere heading under which all living beings are inscribed at a certain moment in certain points of space a visible current has taken rise this current of life traversing the bodies it has organized one after another passing from generation to generation has become divided amongst species and distributed amongst individuals without losing anything of its force rather intensifying in proportion to its advance it is well known that on the theory of the continuity of the germ plasm maintained by weismann the sexual elements of the generating organism pass on their properties directly to the sexual elements of the organism engendered in this extreme form the theory has seemed debatable for it is only in exceptional cases that there are any signs of sexual glands at the time of segmentation of the fertilized egg but though the cells that engender the sexual elements do not generally appear at the beginning of the embryonic life it is none the less true that they are always formed out of those tissues of the embryo which have not undergone any particular functional differentiation and whose cells are made of unmodified protoplasm in other words the genetic power of the fertilized ovum weakens the more it is spread over the growing mass of the tissues of the embryo but while it is being thus diluted it is concentrating anew something of itself on a certain special point to wit the cells from which the ova or spermatozoa will develop it might therefore be said that though the germ plasm is not continuous there is at least continuity of genetic energy this energy being expended only at certain instants for just enough time to give the requisite impulsion to the embryonic life and being recouped as soon as possible in new sexual elements in which again it bides its time regarded from this point of view life is like a current passing from germ to germ through the medium of a developed organism it is as if the organism itself were only an excrescence a bud caused to sprout by the former germ endeavouring to continue itself into a new germ the essential thing is the continuous progress indefinitely pursued an invisible progress on which each visible organism rides during the short interval of time given it to live now the more we fix our attention on this continuity of life the more we see that organic evolution resembles the evolution of a consciousness in which the past presses against the present and causes the upspringing of a new form of consciousness incommensurable with its antecedents that the appearance of a vegetable or animal species is due to specific causes nobody will gainsay but this can only mean that if after the fact we could know these causes in detail we could explain by them the form that has been produced foreseeing the form is out of the question it may perhaps be said that the form could be foreseen if we could know in all their details the conditions under which it will be produced but these conditions are built up into it and are part and parcel of its being they are peculiar to that phase of its history in which life finds itself at the moment of producing the form how could we know beforehand a situation that is unique of its kind that has never yet occurred and will never occur again of the future only that is foreseen which is like the past or can be made up again with elements like those of the past 
such is the case with astronomical physical and chemical facts with all facts which form part of a system in which elements supposed to be unchanging are merely put together in which the only changes are changes of position in which there is no theoretical absurdity in imagining that things are restored to their place in which consequently the same total phenomenon or at least the same elementary phenomena can be repeated but an original situation which imparts something of its own originality to its elements that is to say to the partial views that are taken of it how can such a situation be pictured as given before it is actually produced all that can be said is that once produced it will be explained by the elements that analysis will then carve out of it now what is true of the production of a new species is also true of the production of a new individual and more generally of any moment of any living form for though the variation must reach a certain importance and a certain generality in order to give rise to a new species it is being produced every moment continuously and insensibly in every living being and it is evident that even the sudden mutations which we now hear of are possible only if a process of incubation or rather of maturing is going on throughout a series of generations that do not seem to change in this sense it might be said of life as of consciousness that at every moment it is creating something but against this idea of the absolute originality and unforeseeability of forms our whole intellect rises in revolt the essential function of our intellect as the evolution of life has fashioned it is to be a light for our conduct to make ready for our action on things to foresee for a given situation the events favourable or unfavourable which may follow thereupon intellect therefore instinctively selects in a given situation whatever is like something already known it seeks this out in order that it may apply its principle that like produces like in just this does the prevision of the future by common sense consist science carries this faculty to the highest possible degree of exactitude and precision but does not alter its essential character like ordinary knowledge in dealing with things science is concerned only with the aspect of repetition though the whole be original science will always manage to analyze it into elements or aspects which are approximately a reproduction of the past science can work only on what is supposed to repeat itself that is to say on what is withdrawn by hypothesis from the action of real time anything that is irreducible and irreversible in the successive moments of a history eludes science to get a notion of this irreducibility and irreversibility we must break with scientific habits which are adapted to the fundamental requirements of thought we must do violence to the mind to go counter to the natural bent of the intellect but that is just the function of philosophy in vain therefore does life evolve before our eyes as a continuous creation of unforeseeable form the idea always persists that form unforeseeability and continuity are mere appearance the outward reflection of our own ignorance what is presented to the senses as a continuous history would break up we are told into a series of successive states what gives you the impression of an original state resolves upon analysis into elementary facts each of which is the repetition of a fact already known what you call an unforeseeable form is only a new arrangement of old elements the elementary causes which in their totality have determined this arrangement are themselves old causes repeated in a new order knowledge of the elements and of the elementary causes would have made it possible to foretell the living form which is their sum and their resultant when we have resolved the biological aspect of phenomena into physico-chemical factors we will leap if necessary over physics and chemistry themselves we will go from masses to molecules from molecules to atoms from atoms to corpuscles we must indeed at last come to something that can be treated as a kind of solar system astronomically if you deny it you oppose the very principle of scientific mechanism and you arbitrarily affirm that living matter is not made of the same elements as other matter we reply that we do not question the fundamental identity of inert matter and organized matter the only question is whether the natural systems which we call living beings must be assimilated to the artificial systems that science cuts out within inert matter or whether they must not rather be compared to that natural system which is the whole of the universe that life is a kind of mechanism i cordially agree but is it the mechanism of parts artificially isolated within the whole of the universe or is it the mechanism of the real whole the real whole might well be we conceive an indivisible continuity 
the systems we cut out within it would properly speaking not then be parts at all they would be partial views of the whole and with these partial views put end to end you will not make even a beginning of the reconstruction of the whole any more than by multiplying photographs of an object in a thousand different aspects you will reproduce the object itself so of life and of the physico-chemical phenomena to which you endeavour to reduce it analysis will undoubtedly resolve the process of organic creation into an ever-growing number of physico-chemical phenomena and chemists and physicists will have to do of course with nothing but these but it does not follow that chemistry and physics will ever give us the key to life a very small element of a curve is very near being a straight line and the smaller it is the nearer in the limit it may be termed a part of the curve or a part of the straight line as you please for in each of its points a curve coincides with its tangent so likewise vitality is tangent at any and every point to physical and chemical forces but such points are as a fact only views taken by a mind which imagines stops at various moments of the movement that generates the curve in reality life is no more made of physico-chemical elements than a curve is composed of straight lines in a general way the most radical progress a science can achieve is the working of the completed results into a new scheme of the whole by relation to which they become instantaneous and motionless views taken at intervals along the continuity of a movement such for example is the relation of modern to ancient geometry the latter purely static worked with figures drawn once for all the former studies the varying of a function that is the continuous movement by which the figure is described no doubt for greater strictness all considerations of motion may be eliminated from mathematical processes but the introduction of motion into the genesis of figures is nevertheless the origin of modern mathematics we believe that if biology could ever get as close to its object as mathematics does to its own it would become to the physics and chemistry of organized bodies what the mathematics of the moderns has proved to be in relation to ancient geometry the wholly superficial displacements of masses and molecules studied in physics and chemistry would become by relation to that inner vital movement which is transformation and not translation what the position of a moving object is to the movement of that object in space and so far as we can see the procedure by which we should then pass from the definition of a certain vital action to the system of physico-chemical facts which it implies would be like passing from the function to its derivative from the equation of the curve that is the law of the continuous movement by which the curve is generated to the equation of the tangent giving its instantaneous direction such a science would be a mechanics of transformation of which our mechanics of translation would become a particular case a simplification a projection on the plane of pure quantity and just as an infinity of functions have the same differential these functions differing from each other by a constant so perhaps the integration of the physico-chemical elements of properly vital action might determine that action only in part a part would be left to indetermination but such an integration can be no more than dreamed of we do not pretend that the dream will ever be realized we are only trying by carrying a certain comparison as far as possible to show up to what point our theory goes along with pure mechanism and where they part company imitation of the living by the unorganized may however go a good way not only does chemistry make organic syntheses but we have succeeded in reproducing artificially the external appearance of certain facts of organization such as indirect cell division and protoplasmic circulation it is well known that the protoplasm of the cell effects various movements within its envelope on the other hand indirect cell division is the outcome of very complex operations some involving the nucleus and others the cytoplasm these latter commence by the doubling of the centrosome a small spherical body alongside the nucleus the two centrosomes thus obtained draw apart attract the broken and doubled ends of the filament of which the original nucleus mainly consisted and join them to form two fresh nuclei about which the two new cells are constructed which will succeed the first now in their broad lines and in their external appearance some at least of these operations have been successfully imitated if some sugar or table salt is pulverized and some very old oil is added and a drop of the mixture is observed under the microscope a froth of alveolar structure is seen whose configuration is like that of protoplasm according to certain theories 
and in which movements take place which are decidedly like those of protoplasmic circulation if in a froth of the same kind the air is extracted from an alveolus a cone of attraction is seen to form like those about the centrosomes which result in the division of the nucleus even the external motions of a unicellular organism of an amoeba at any rate are sometimes explained mechanically the displacements of an amoeba in a drop of water would be comparable to the motion to and fro of a grain of dust in a draughty room its mass is all the time absorbing certain soluble matters contained in the surrounding water and giving back to it certain others these continual exchanges like those between two vessels separated by a porous partition would create an ever-changing vortex around the little organism as for the temporary prolongations or pseudopodia which the amoeba seems to make they would be not so much given out by it as attracted from it by a kind of inhalation or suction of the surrounding medium in the same way we may perhaps come to explain the more complex movements which the infusorian makes with its vibratory cilia which moreover are probably only fixed pseudopodia but scientists are far from agreed on the value of explanations and schemas of this sort chemists have pointed out that even in the organic not to go so far as the organized science has reconstructed hitherto nothing but waste products of vital activity the peculiarly active plastic substances obstinately defy synthesis one of the most notable naturalists of our time has insisted on the opposition of two orders of phenomena observed in living tissues anagenesis and catagenesis the role of the anagenetic energies is to raise the inferior energies to their own level by assimilating inorganic substances they construct the tissues on the other hand the actual functioning of life excepting of course assimilation growth and reproduction is of the catagenic order exhibiting the fall not the rise of energy it is only with these facts of catagenic order that physicochemistry deals that is in short with the dead and not with the living the other kind of facts certainly seem to defy physicochemical analysis even if they are not anagenetic in the proper sense of the word as for the artificial imitation of the outward appearance of protoplasm should a real theoretic importance be attached to this when the question of the physical framework of protoplasm is not yet settled we are still further from compounding protoplasm chemically finally a physicochemical explanation of the motions of the amoeba and a fortiori of the behaviour of the infusoria seems impossible to many of those who have closely observed these rudimentary organisms even in these humblest manifestations of life they discover traces of an effective psychological activity but instructive above all is the fact that the tendency to explain everything by physics and chemistry is discouraged rather than strengthened by deep study of histological phenomena such is the conclusion of the truly admirable book which the histologist e b wilson has devoted to the development of the cell the study of the cell has on the whole seemed to widen rather than to narrow the enormous gap that separates even the lowest forms of life from the inorganic world to sum up those who are concerned only with the functional activity of the living being are inclined to believe that physics and chemistry will give us the key to biological processes they have chiefly to do as a fact with phenomena that are repeated continually in the living being as in a chemical retort this explains in some measure the mechanistic tendencies of physiology on the contrary those whose attention is concentrated on the minute structure of living tissues on their genesis and evolution histologists and embryogenists on the one hand naturalists on the other are interested in the retort itself not merely in its contents they find that this retort creates its own form through a unique series of acts that really constitute a history thus histologists embryogenists and naturalists believe far less readily than physiologists in the physico-chemical character of vital actions the fact is neither one nor the other of these two theories neither that which affirms nor that which denies the possibility of chemically producing an elementary organism can claim the authority of experiment they are both unverifiable the former because science has not advanced a step toward the chemical synthesis of a living substance the second because there is no conceivable way of proving experimentally the impossibility of a fact but we have set forth the theoretical reasons which prevent us from likening the living being a system closed off by nature to the systems which our science isolates these reasons have less force we acknowledge 
in the case of a rudimentary organism like the amoeba which hardly evolves at all but they acquire more when we consider a complex organism which goes through a regular cycle of transformations the more duration marks the living being with its imprint the more obviously the organism differs from a mere mechanism over which duration glides without penetrating and the demonstration has most force when it applies to the evolution of life as a whole from its humblest origins to its highest forms inasmuch as this evolution constitutes through the unity and continuity of the animated matter which supports it a single indivisible history thus viewed the evolutionist hypothesis does not seem so closely akin to the mechanist conception of life as it is generally supposed to be of this mechanistic conception we do not claim of course to furnish a mathematical and final refutation but the refutation which we draw from the consideration of real time and which is in our opinion the only refutation possible becomes the more rigorous and cogent the more frankly the evolutionist hypothesis is assumed we must dwell a good deal more on this point but let us first show more clearly the notion of life to which we are leading up the mechanistic explanations we said hold good for the systems that our thought artificially detaches from the whole but of the whole itself and of the systems which within this whole seem to take after it we cannot admit a priori that they are mechanically explicable for then time would be useless and even unreal the essence of mechanical explanation in fact is to regard the future and the past as calculable functions of the present and thus to claim that all is given on this hypothesis past present and future would be open at a glance to a superhuman intellect capable of making the calculation indeed the scientists who have believed in the universality and perfect objectivity of mechanical explanations have consciously or unconsciously acted on a hypothesis of this kind laplace formulated it with the greatest precision an intellect which at a given instant knew all the forces with which nature is animated and the respective situations of the beings that compose nature supposing the said intellect were vast enough to subject these data to analysis would embrace in the same formula the motions of the greatest bodies in the universe and those of the slightest atom nothing would be uncertain for it and the future like the past would be present to its eyes and du bois raymond we can imagine the knowledge of nature arrived at a point where the universal process of the world might be represented by a single mathematical formula by one immense system of simultaneous differential equations from which could be deduced for each moment the position direction and velocity of every atom of the world huxley has expressed the same idea in a more concrete form if the fundamental proposition of evolution is true that the entire world living and not living is the result of the mutual interaction according to definite laws of the forces possessed by the molecules of which the primitive nebulosity of the universe was composed it is no less certain that the existing world lay potentially in the cosmic vapour and that a sufficient intellect could from a knowledge of the properties of the molecules of that vapour have predicted say the state of the fauna of great britain in eighteen sixty nine with as much certainty as one can say what will happen to the vapour of the breath in a cold winter's day in such a doctrine time is still spoken of one pronounces the word but one does not think of the thing for time is here deprived of efficacy and if it does nothing it is nothing radical mechanism implies a metaphysic in which the totality of the real is postulated complete in eternity and in which the apparent duration of things expresses merely the infirmity of a mind that cannot know everything at once but duration is something very different from this for our consciousness that is to say for that which is most indisputable in our experience we perceive duration as a stream against which we cannot go it is the foundation of our being and as we feel the very substance of the world in which we live it is of no use to hold up before our eyes the dazzling prospect of a universal mathematic we cannot sacrifice experience to the requirements of a system that is why we reject radical mechanism but radical finalism is quite as unacceptable and for the same reason the doctrine of teleology in its extreme form as we find it in leibniz for example implies that things and beings merely realize a program previously arranged but if there is nothing unforeseen no invention or creation in the universe time is useless again as in the mechanistic hypothesis here again it is supposed that all is given 
finalism thus understood is only inverted mechanism it springs from the same postulate with this sole difference that in the movement of our finite intellects along successive things whose successiveness is reduced to a mere appearance it holds in front of us the light with which it claims to guide us instead of putting it behind it substitutes the attraction of the future for the impulsion of the past but succession remains none the less a mere appearance as indeed does movement itself in the doctrine of leibniz time is reduced to a confused perception relative to the human standpoint a perception which would vanish like a rising mist for a mind seated at the centre of things yet finalism is not like mechanism a doctrine with fixed rigid outlines it admits of as many inflections as we like the mechanistic philosophy is to be taken or left it must be left if the least grain of dust by straying from the path foreseen by mechanics should show the slightest trace of spontaneity the doctrine of final causes on the contrary will never be definitively refuted if one form of it be put aside it will take another its principle which is essentially psychological is very flexible it is so extensible and thereby so comprehensive that one accepts something of it as soon as one rejects pure mechanism the theory we shall put forward in this book will therefore necessarily partake of finalism to a certain extent for that reason it is important to intimate exactly what we are going to take of it and what we mean to leave let us say at once that to thin out the leibnizian finalism by breaking it into an infinite number of pieces seems to us a step in the wrong direction this is however the tendency of the doctrine of finality it fully realizes that if the universe as a whole is the carrying out of a plan this cannot be demonstrated empirically and that even of the organized world alone it is hardly easier to prove all harmonious facts would equally well testify to the contrary nature sets living beings at discord with one another she everywhere presents disorder alongside of order retrogression alongside of progress but though finality cannot be affirmed either of the whole of matter or of the whole of life might it not yet be true says the finalist of each organism taken separately is there not a wonderful division of labor a marvelous solidarity among the parts of an organism perfect order in infinite complexity does not each living being thus realize a plan immanent in its substance this theory consists at bottom in breaking up the original notion of finality into bits it does not accept indeed it ridicules the idea of an external finality according to which living beings are ordered with regard to each other to suppose the grass made for the cow the lamb for the wolf that is all acknowledged to be absurd but there is we are told an internal finality each being is made for itself all its parts conspire for the greatest good of the whole and are intelligently organized in view of that end such is the notion of finality which has long been classic finalism has shrunk to the point of never embracing more than one living being at a time by making itself smaller it probably thought it would offer less surface for blows the truth is it lay open to them a great deal more radical as our own theory may appear finality is external or it is nothing at all consider the most complex and the most harmonious organism all the elements we are told conspire for the greatest good of the whole very well but let us not forget that each of these elements may itself be an organism in certain cases and that in subordinating the existence of this small organism to the life of the great one we accept the principle of an external finality the idea of a finality that is always internal is therefore a self-destructive notion an organism is composed of tissues each of which lives for itself the cells of which the tissues are made have also a certain independence strictly speaking if the subordination of all the elements of the individual to the individual itself were complete we might contend that they are not organisms reserve the name organism for the individual and recognize only internal finality but everyone knows that these elements may possess a true autonomy to say nothing of phagocytes which push independence to the point of attacking the organism that nourishes them or of germinal cells which have their own life alongside the somatic cells the facts of regeneration are enough here an element or a group of elements suddenly reveals that however limited its normal space and function it can transcend them occasionally it may even in certain cases be regarded as the equivalent of the whole there lies the stumbling block of the vitalistic theories 
we shall not reproach them as is ordinarily done with replying to the question by the question itself the vital principle may indeed not explain much but it is at least a sort of label affixed to our ignorance so as to remind us of this occasionally while mechanism invites us to ignore that ignorance but the position of vitalism is rendered very difficult by the fact that in nature there is neither purely internal finality nor absolutely distinct individuality the organized elements composing the individual have themselves a certain individuality and each will claim its vital principle if the individual pretends to have its own but on the other hand the individual itself is not sufficiently independent not sufficiently cut off from other things for us to allow it a vital principle of its own an organism such as a higher vertebrate is the most individuated of all organisms yet if we take into account that it is only the development of an ovum forming part of the body of its mother and of a spermatozoan belonging to the body of its father that the egg that is the ovum fertilized is a connecting link between the two progenitors since it is common to their two substances we shall realize that every individual organism even that of a man is merely a bud that has sprouted on the combined body of both its parents where then does the vital principle of the individual begin or end gradually we shall be carried further and further back up to the individual's remotest ancestors we shall find him solidary with each of them solidary with that little mass of protoplasmic jelly which is probably at the root of the genealogical tree of life being to a certain extent one with this primitive ancestor he is also solidary with all that descends from the ancestor in divergent directions in this sense each individual may be said to remain united with the totality of living beings by invisible bonds so it is of no use to try to restrict finality to the individuality of the living being if there is finality in the world of life it includes the whole of life in a single indivisible embrace this life common to all the living undoubtedly presents many gaps and incoherences and again it is not so mathematically one that it cannot allow each being to become individualized to a certain degree but it forms a single whole none the less and we have to choose between the out and out negation of finality and the hypothesis which coordinates not only the parts of an organism with the organism itself but also each living being with the collective whole of all others finality will not go down any easier for being taken as a powder either the hypothesis of a finality immanent in life should be rejected as a whole or it must undergo a treatment very different from pulverization the error of radical finalism as also that of radical mechanism is to extend too far the application of certain concepts that are natural to our intellect originally we think only in order to act our intellect has been cast in the mould of action speculation is a luxury while action is a necessity now in order to act we begin by proposing an end we make a plan then we go on to the detail of the mechanism which will bring it to pass this latter operation is possible only if we know what we can reckon on we must therefore have managed to extract resemblances from nature which enable us to anticipate the future thus we must consciously or unconsciously have made use of the law of causality moreover the more sharply the idea of efficient causality is defined in our mind the more it takes the form of a mechanical causality and this scheme in its turn is the more mathematical according as it expresses a more rigorous necessity that is why we have only to follow the bent of our mind to become mathematicians but on the other hand this natural mathematics is only the rigid unconscious skeleton beneath our conscious supple habit of linking the same causes to the same effects and the usual object of this habit is to guide actions inspired by intentions or what comes to the same to direct movements combined with a view to reproducing a pattern we are born artisans as we are born geometricians and indeed we are geometricians only because we are artisans thus the human intellect inasmuch as it is fashioned for the needs of human action is an intellect which proceeds at the same time by intention and by calculation by adapting means to ends and by thinking out mechanisms of more and more geometrical form whether nature be conceived as an immense machine regulated by mathematical laws or as the realization of a plan these two ways of regarding it are only the consummation of two tendencies of mind which are complementary to each other and which have their origin in the same vital necessities for that reason radical finalism is very near radical mechanism on many points 
both doctrines are reluctant to see in the course of things generally or even simply in the development of life an unforeseeable creation of form in considering reality mechanism regards only the aspect of similarity or repetition it is therefore dominated by this law that in nature there is only like reproducing like the more the geometry in mechanism is emphasized the less can mechanism admit that anything is ever created even pure form in so far as we are geometricians then we reject the unforeseeable we might accept it assuredly in so far as we are artists for art lives on creation and implies a latent belief in the spontaneity of nature but disinterested art is a luxury like pure speculation long before being artists we are artisans and all fabrication however rudimentary lives on likeness and repetition like the natural geometry which serves as its fulcrum fabrication works on models which it sets out to reproduce and even when it invents it proceeds or imagines itself to proceed by a new arrangement of elements already known its principle is that we must have like to produce like in short the strict application of the principle of finality like that of the principle of mechanical causality leads to the conclusion that all is given both principles say the same thing in their respective languages because they respond to the same need that is why again they agree in doing away with time real duration is that duration which gnaws on things and leaves on them the mark of its tooth if everything is in time everything changes inwardly and the same concrete reality never recurs repetition is therefore possible only in the abstract what is repeated is some aspect that our senses and especially our intellect have singled out from reality just because our action upon which all the effort of our intellect is directed can move only among repetitions thus concentrated on that which repeats solely preoccupied in welding the same to the same intellect turns away from the vision of time it dislikes what is fluid and solidifies everything it touches we do not think real time but we live it because life transcends intellect the feeling we have of our evolution and of the evolution of all things in pure duration is there forming around the intellectual concept properly so called an indistinct fringe that fades off into darkness mechanism and finalism agree in taking account only of the bright nucleus shining in the centre they forget that this nucleus has been formed out of the rest by condensation and that the whole must be used the fluid as well as and more than the condensed in order to grasp the inner movement of life indeed if the fringe exists however delicate and indistinct it should have more importance for philosophy than the bright nucleus it surrounds for it is its presence that enables us to affirm that the nucleus is a nucleus that pure intellect is a contraction by condensation of a more extensive power and just because this vague intuition is of no help in directing our action on things which action takes place exclusively on the surface of reality we may presume that it is to be exercised not merely on the surface but below as soon as we go out of the encasings in which radical mechanism and radical finalism confine our thought reality appears as a ceaseless upspringing of something new which has no sooner arisen to make the present than it has already fallen back into the past at this exact moment it falls under the glance of the intellect whose eyes are ever turned to the rear this is already the case with our inner life for each of our acts we shall easily find antecedents of which it may in some sort be said to be the mechanical resultant and it may equally well be said that each action is the realization of an intention in this sense mechanism is everywhere and finality everywhere in the evolution of our conduct but if our action be one that involves the whole of our person and is truly ours it could not have been foreseen even though its antecedents explain it when once it has been accomplished and though it be the realizing of an intention it differs as a present and new reality from the intention which can never aim at anything but recommencing or rearranging the past mechanism and finalism are therefore here only external views of our conduct they extract its intellectuality but our conduct slips between them and extends much further once again this does not mean that free action is capricious unreasonable action to behave according to caprice is to oscillate mechanically between two or more ready-made alternatives and at length to settle on one of them it is no real maturing of an internal state no real evolution it is merely however paradoxical the assertion may seem bending the will to imitate the mechanism of the intellect 
a conduct that is truly our own on the contrary is that of a will which does not try to counterfeit intellect and which remaining itself that is to say evolving ripens gradually into acts which the intellect will be able to resolve indefinitely into intelligible elements without ever reaching its goal the free act is incommensurable with the idea and its rationality must be defined by this very incommensurability which admits the discovery of as much intelligibility within it as we will such is the character of our own evolution and such also without doubt that of the evolution of life our reason incorrigibly presumptuous imagines itself possessed by right of birth or by right of conquest innate or acquired of all the essential elements of the knowledge of truth even where it confesses that it does not know the object presented to it it believes that its ignorance consists only in not knowing which one of its time-honoured categories suits the new object in what drawer ready to open shall we put it in what garment already cut out shall we clothe it is it this or that or the other thing and this and that and the other thing are always something already conceived already known the idea that for a new object we might have to create a new concept perhaps a new method of thinking is deeply repugnant to us the history of philosophy is there however and shows us the eternal conflict of systems the impossibility of satisfactorily getting the real into the ready-made garments of our ready-made concepts the necessity of making to measure but rather than go to this extremity our reason prefers to announce once for all with a proud modesty that it has to do only with the relative and that the absolute is not in its province this preliminary declaration enables it to apply its habitual method of thought without any scruple and thus under pretence that it does not touch the absolute to make absolute judgments upon everything plato was the first to set up the theory that to know the real consists in finding its idea that is to say in forcing it into a pre-existing frame already at our disposal as if we implicitly possessed universal knowledge but this belief is natural to the human intellect always engaged as it is in determining under what former heading it shall catalogue any new object and it may be said that in a certain sense we are all born platonists nowhere is the inadequacy of this method so obvious as in theories of life if in evolving in the direction of the vertebrates in general of man and intellect in particular life has had to abandon by the way many elements incompatible with this particular mode of organization and consign them as we shall show to other lines of development it is the totality of these elements that we must find again and rejoin to the intellect proper in order to grasp the true nature of vital activity and we shall probably be aided in this by the fringe of vague intuition that surrounds our distinct that is intellectual representation for what can this useless fringe be if not that part of the evolving principle which has not shrunk to the peculiar form of our organization but has settled around it unasked for unwanted it is there accordingly that we must look for hints to expand the intellectual form of our thought from there shall we derive the impetus necessary to lift us above ourselves to form an idea of the whole of life cannot consist in combining simple ideas that have been left behind in us by life itself in the course of its evolution how could the part be equivalent to the whole the content to the container a by-product of the vital operation to the operation itself such however is our illusion when we define the evolution of life as a passage from the homogeneous to the heterogeneous or by any other concept obtained by putting fragments of intellect side by side we place ourselves in one of the points where evolution comes to a head the principal one no doubt but not the only one and there we do not even take all we find for of the intellect we keep only one or two of the concepts by which it expresses itself and it is this part of a part that we declare representative of the whole of something indeed which goes beyond the concrete whole i mean of the evolution movement of which this whole is only the present stage the truth is that to represent this the entire intellect would not be too much nay it would not be enough it would be necessary to add to it what we find in every other terminal point of evolution and these diverse and divergent elements must be considered as so many extracts which are or at least which were in their humblest form mutually complementary only then might we have an inkling of the real nature of the evolution movement and even then we should fail to grasp it completely for we should still be dealing only with the evolved which is a result and not with evolution itself which is the act by which the result is obtained such is the philosophy of life to which we are leading up 
it claims to transcend both mechanism and finalism but as we announced at the beginning it is nearer the second doctrine than the first it will not be amiss to dwell on this point and show more precisely how far this philosophy of life resembles finalism and wherein it is different like radical finalism although in a vaguer form our philosophy represents the organized world as a harmonious whole but this harmony is far from being as perfect as it has been claimed to be it admits of much discord because each species each individual even retains only a certain impetus from the universal vital impulsion and tends to use this energy in its own interest in this consists adaptation the species and the individual thus think only of themselves whence arises a possible conflict with other forms of life harmony therefore does not exist in fact it exists rather in principle i mean that the original impetus is a common impetus and the higher we ascend the stream of life the more do diverse tendencies appear complementary to each other thus the wind at a street corner divides into diverging currents which are all one and the same gust harmony or rather complementarity is revealed only in the mass in tendencies rather than in states especially and this is the point on which finalism has been most seriously mistaken harmony is rather behind us than before it is due to an identity of impulsion and not to a common aspiration it would be futile to try to assign to life an end in the human sense of the word to speak of an end is to think of a pre-existing model which is only to be realized it is to suppose therefore that all is given and that the future can be read in the present it is to believe that life in its movement and in its entirety goes to work like our intellect which is only a motionless and fragmentary view of life and which naturally takes its stand outside of time life on the contrary progresses and endures in time of course when once the road has been travelled we can glance over it mark its direction note this in psychological terms and speak as if there had been pursuit of an end thus shall we speak ourselves but of the road which was going to be travelled the human mind could have nothing to say for the road has been created pari passu with the act of travelling over it being nothing but the direction of this act itself at every instant then evolution must admit of a psychological interpretation which is from our point of view the best interpretation but this explanation has neither value nor even significance except retrospectively never could the finalistic interpretation such as we shall propose it be taken for an anticipation of the future it is a particular mode of viewing the past in the light of the present in short the classic conception of finality postulates at once too much and too little it is both too wide and too narrow in explaining life by intellect it limits too much the meaning of life intellect such at least as we find it in ourselves has been fashioned by evolution during the course of progress it is cut out of something larger or rather it is only the projection necessarily on a plane of a reality that possesses both relief and depth it is this more comprehensive reality that true finalism ought to reconstruct or rather if possible embrace in one view but on the other hand just because it goes beyond intellect the faculty of connecting the same with the same of perceiving and also of producing repetitions this reality is undoubtedly creative that is productive of effects in which it expands and transcends its own being these effects were therefore not given in it in advance and so it could not take them for ends although when once produced they admit of a rational interpretation like that of the manufactured article that has reproduced a model in short the theory of final causes does not go far enough when it confines itself to ascribing some intelligence to nature and it goes too far when it supposes a pre-existence of the future in the present in the form of idea and the second theory which sins by excess is the outcome of the first which sins by defect in place of intellect proper must be substituted the more comprehensive reality of which intellect is only the contraction the future then appears as expanding the present it was not therefore contained in the present in the form of a represented end and yet once realized it will explain the present as much as the present explains it and even more it must be viewed as an end as much as and more than a result our intellect has a right to consider the future abstractly from its habitual point of view being itself an abstract view of the cause of its own being it is true that the cause may then seem beyond our grasp already the finalist theory of life eludes all precise verification what if we go beyond it in one of its directions here in fact after a necessary digression we are back at the question which we regard as essential 
can the insufficiency of mechanism be proved by facts we said that if this demonstration is possible it is on condition of frankly accepting the evolutionist hypothesis we must now show that if mechanism is insufficient to account for evolution the way of proving this insufficiency is not to stop at the classic conception of finality still less to contract or attenuate it but on the contrary to go further let us indicate at once the principle of our demonstration we said of life that from its origin it is the continuation of one and the same impetus divided into divergent lines of evolution something has grown something has developed by a series of additions which have been so many creations this very development has brought about a dissociation of tendencies which were unable to grow beyond a certain point without becoming mutually incompatible strictly speaking there is nothing to prevent our imagining that the evolution of life might have taken place in one single individual by means of a series of transformations spread over thousands of ages or instead of a single individual any number might be supposed succeeding each other in a unilinear series in both cases evolution would have had so to speak one dimension only but evolution has actually taken place through millions of individuals on divergent lines each ending at a crossing from which new paths radiate and so on indefinitely if our hypothesis is justified if the essential causes working along these diverse roads are of psychological nature they must keep something in common in spite of the divergence of their effects as schoolfellows long separated keep the same memories of boyhood roads may fork or byways be opened along which dissociated elements may evolve in an independent manner but nevertheless it is in virtue of the primitive impetus of the whole that the movement of the parts continues something of the whole therefore must abide in the parts and this common element will be evident to us in some way perhaps by the presence of identical organs in very different organisms suppose for an instant that the mechanistic explanation is the true one evolution must then have occurred through a series of accidents added to one another each new accident being preserved by selection if it is advantageous to that sum of former advantageous accidents which the present form of the living being represents what likelihood is there that by two entirely different series of accidents being added together two entirely different evolutions will arrive at similar results the more two lines of evolution diverge the less probability is there that accidental outer influences or accidental inner variations bring about the construction of the same apparatus upon them especially if there was no trace of this apparatus at the moment of divergence but such similarity of the two products would be natural on the contrary on a hypothesis like ours even in the latest channel there would be something of the impulsion received at the source pure mechanism then would be refutable and finality in the special sense in which we understand it would be demonstrable in a certain aspect if it could be proved that life may manufacture the like apparatus by unlike means on divergent lines of evolution and the strength of the proof would be proportional both to the divergency between the lines of evolution thus chosen and to the complexity of the similar structures found in them it will be said that the resemblance of structure is due to sameness of the general conditions in which life has evolved and that these permanent outer conditions may have imposed the same direction on the forces constructing this or that apparatus in spite of the diversity of transient outer influences and accidental inner changes we are not of course blind to the role which the concept of adaptation plays in the science of today biologists certainly do not all make the same use of it some think the outer conditions capable of causing change in organisms in a direct manner in a definite direction through physico-chemical alterations induced by them in the living substance such is the hypothesis of eimer for example others more faithful to the spirit of darwinism believe the influence of conditions works indirectly only through favoring in the struggle for life those representatives of a species which the chance of birth has best adapted to the environment in other words some attribute a positive influence to outer conditions and say that they actually give rise to variations while the others say that these conditions have only a negative influence and merely eliminate variations but in both cases the outer conditions are supposed to bring about a precise adjustment of the organism to its circumstances both parties then will attempt to explain mechanically by adaptation to similar conditions the similarities of structure which we think are the strongest argument against mechanism so we must at once indicate in a general way before passing to the detail why explanations from adaptation seem to us insufficient 
let us first remark that of the two hypotheses just described the latter is the only one which is not equivocal the darwinian idea of adaptation by automatic elimination of the unadapted is a simple and clear idea but just because it attributes to the outer cause which controls evolution a merely negative influence it has great difficulty in accounting for the progressive and so to say rectilinear development of complex apparatus such as we are about to examine how much greater will this difficulty be in the case of the similar structure of two extremely complex organs on two entirely different lines of evolution an accidental variation however minute implies the working of a great number of small physical and chemical causes an accumulation of accidental variations such as would be necessary to produce a complex structure requires therefore the concurrence of an almost infinite number of infinitesimal causes why should these causes entirely accidental recur the same and in the same order at different points of space and time no one will hold that this is the case and the darwinian himself will probably merely maintain that identical effects may arise from different causes that more than one road leads to the same spot but let us not be fooled by a metaphor the place reached does not give the form of the road that leads there while an organic structure is just the accumulation of those small differences which evolution has had to go through in order to achieve it the struggle for life and natural selection can be of no use to us in solving this part of the problem for we are not concerned here with what has perished we have to do only with what has survived now we see that identical structures have been formed on independent lines of evolution by a gradual accumulation of effects how can accidental causes occurring in an accidental order be supposed to have repeatedly come to the same result the causes being infinitely numerous and the effect infinitely complicated the principle of mechanism is that the same causes produce the same effects this principle of course does not always imply that the same effects must have the same causes but it does involve this consequence in the particular case in which the causes remain visible in the effect that they produce and are indeed its constitutive elements the two walkers starting from different points and wandering at random should finally meet is no great wonder but that throughout their walk they should describe two identical curves exactly superposable on each other is altogether unlikely the improbability will be the greater the more complicated the routes and it will become impossibility if the zigzags are infinitely complicated now what is this complexity of zigzags as compared with that of an organ in which thousands of different cells each being itself a kind of organism are arranged in a definite order let us turn then to the other hypothesis and see how it would solve the problem adaptation it says is not merely elimination of the unadapted it is due to the positive influence of outer conditions that have molded the organism on their own form this time similarity of effects will be explained by similarity of cause we shall remain apparently in pure mechanism but if we look closely we shall see that the explanation is merely verbal that we are again the dupes of words and that the trick of the solution consists in taking the term adaptation in two entirely different senses at the same time if i pour into the same glass by turns water and wine the two liquids will take the same form and the sameness in form will be due to the sameness in adaptation of content to container adaptation here really means mechanical adjustment the reason is that the form to which the matter has adapted itself was there ready-made and has forced its own shape on the matter but in the adaptation of an organism to the circumstances it has to live in where is the pre-existing form awaiting its matter the circumstances are not a mould into which life is inserted and whose form life adopts this is indeed to be fooled by a metaphor there is no form yet and the life must create a form for itself suited to the circumstances which are made for it it will have to make the best of these circumstances neutralize their inconveniences and utilize their advantages in short respond to outer actions by building up a machine which has no resemblance to them such adapting is not repeating but replying an entirely different thing if there is still adaptation it will be in the sense in which one may say of the solution of a problem of geometry for example that it is adapted to the conditions i grant indeed that adaptation so understood explains why different evolutionary processes result in similar forms the same problem of course calls for the same solution but it is necessary then to introduce as for the solution of a problem of geometry an intelligent activity or at least a cause which behaves in the same way this is to bring in finality again 
and a finality this time more than ever charged with anthropomorphic elements in a word if the adaptation is passive if it is mere repetition in the relief of what the conditions give in the mould it will build up nothing that one tries to make it build and if it is active capable of responding by a calculated solution to the problem which is set out in the conditions that is going further than we do too far indeed in our opinion in the direction we indicated in the beginning but the truth is that there is a surreptitious passing from one of these two meanings to the other a flight for refuge to the first whenever one is about to be caught in flagrante delicto of finalism by employing the second it is really the second which serves the usual practice of science but it is the first that generally provides its philosophy in any particular case one talks as if the process of adaptation were an effort of the organism to build up a machine capable of turning external circumstances to the best possible account then one speaks of adaptation in general as if it were the very impress of circumstances passively received by an indifferent matter end of section two section three of evolution creatrice by henri bergson translated by arthur mitchell this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter one part three but let us come to the examples it would be interesting first to institute here a general comparison between plants and animals one cannot fail to be struck with the parallel progress which has been accomplished on both sides in the direction of sexuality not only is fecundation itself the same in higher plants and in animals since it consists in both in the union of two nuclei that differ in their properties and structure before their union and immediately after become equivalent to each other but the preparation of sexual elements goes on in both under like conditions it consists essentially in the reduction of the number of chromosomes and the rejection of a certain quantity of chromatic substance yet vegetables and animals have evolved on independent lines favoured by unlike circumstances opposed by unlike obstacles here are two great series which have gone on diverging on either line thousands and thousands of causes have combined to determine the morphological and functional evolution yet these infinitely complicated causes have been consummated in each series in the same effect and this effect could hardly be called a phenomenon of adaptation where is the adaptation where is the pressure of external circumstances there is no striking utility in sexual generation it has been interpreted in the most diverse ways and some very acute inquirers even regard the sexuality of the plant at least as a luxury which nature might have dispensed with but we do not wish to dwell on facts so disputed the ambiguity of the term adaptation and the necessity of transcending both the point of view of mechanical causality and that of anthropomorphic finality will stand out more clearly with simpler examples at all times the doctrine of finality has laid much stress on the marvellous structure of the sense organs in order to liken the work of nature to that of an intelligent workman now since these organs are found in a rudimentary state in the lower animals and since nature offers us many intermediaries between the pigment spot of the simplest organisms and the infinitely complex eye of the vertebrates it may just as well be alleged that the result has been brought about by natural selection perfecting the organ automatically in short if there is a case in which it seems justifiable to invoke adaptation it is this particular one for there may be discussion about the function and meaning of such a thing as sexual generation in so far as it is related to the conditions in which it occurs but the relation of the eye to light is obvious and when we call this relation an adaptation we must know what we mean if then we can show in this privileged case the insufficiency of the principles invoked on both sides our demonstration will at once have reached a high degree of generality let us consider the example on which the advocates of finality have always insisted the structure of such an organ as the human eye they have had no difficulty in showing that in this extremely complicated apparatus all the elements are marvellously coordinated in order that vision shall operate says the author of a well-known book on final causes the sclerotic membrane must become transparent in one point of its surface so as to enable luminous rays to pierce it the cornea must correspond exactly with the opening of the socket behind this transparent opening there must be refracting media 
there must be a retina at the extremity of the dark chamber perpendicular to the retina there must be an innumerable quantity of transparent cones permitting only the light directed in the line of their axes to reach the nervous membrane etc etc in reply the advocate of final causes has been invited to assume the evolutionist hypothesis everything is marvellous indeed if one consider an eye like ours in which thousands of elements are coordinated in a single function but take the function at its origin in the infusorian where it is reduced to the mere impressionability almost purely chemical of a pigment spot to light this function possibly only an accidental fact in the beginning may have brought about a slight complication of the organ which again induced an improvement of the function it may have done this either directly through some unknown mechanism or indirectly merely through the effect of the advantages it brought to the living being and the hold it thus offered to natural selection thus the progressive formation of an eye as well contrived as ours would be explained by an almost infinite number of actions and reactions between the function and the organ without the intervention of other than mechanical causes the question is hard to decide indeed when put directly between the function and the organ as is done in the doctrine of finality as also mechanism itself does for organ and function are terms of different nature and each conditions the other so closely that it is impossible to say a priori whether in expressing their relation we should begin with the first as does mechanism or with the second as finalism requires but the discussion would take an entirely different turn we think if we began by comparing together two terms of the same nature an organ with an organ instead of an organ with its function in this case it would be possible to proceed little by little to a solution more and more plausible and there would be the more chance of a successful issue the more resolutely we assumed the evolutionist hypothesis let us place side by side the eye of a vertebrate and that of a mollusk such as the common pecten we find the same essential parts in each composed of analogous elements the eye of the pecten presents a retina a cornea a lens of cellular structure like our own there is even that peculiar inversion of retinal elements which is not met with in general in the retina of the invertebrates now the origin of mollusks may be a debated question but whatever opinion we hold all are agreed that mollusks and vertebrates separated from their common parent stem long before the appearance of an eye so complex as that of the pecten whence then the structural analogy let us question on this point the two opposed systems of evolutionist explanation in turn the hypothesis of purely accidental variations and that of a variation directed in a definite way under the influence of external conditions the first as is well known is presented today in two quite different forms darwin spoke of very slight variations being accumulated by natural selection he was not ignorant of the facts of sudden variation but he thought these sports as he called them were only monstrosities incapable of perpetuating themselves and he accounted for the genesis of species by an accumulation of insensible variations such is still the opinion of many naturalists it is tending however to give way to the opposite idea that a new species comes into being all at once by the simultaneous appearance of several new characters all somewhat different from the previous ones this latter hypothesis already proposed by various authors notably by bateson in a remarkable book has become deeply significant and acquired great force since the striking experiments of hugo de vries this botanist working on the inothera lamarckiana obtained at the end of a few generations a certain number of new species the theory he deduces from his experiments is of the highest interest species pass through alternate periods of stability and transformation when the period of mutability occurs unexpected forms spring forth in a great number of different directions we will not attempt to take sides between this hypothesis and that of insensible variations indeed perhaps both are partly true we wish merely to point out that if the variations invoked are accidental they do not whether small or great account for a similarity of structure such as we have cited let us assume to begin with the darwinian theory of insensible variations and suppose the occurrence of small differences due to chance and continually accumulating it must not be forgotten that all the parts of an organism are necessarily coordinated whether the function be the effect of the organ or its cause it matters little one point is certain the organ will be of no use and will not give selection a whole unless it functions 
however the minute structure of the retina may develop and however complicated it may become such progress instead of favoring vision will probably hinder it if the visual centers do not develop at the same time as well as several parts of the visual organ itself if the variations are accidental how can they ever agree to arise in every part of the organ at the same time in such way that the organ will continue to perform its function darwin quite understood this it is one of the reasons why he regarded variation as insensible for a difference which arises accidentally at one point of the visual apparatus if it be very slight will not hinder the functioning of the organ and hence this first accidental variation can in a sense wait for complementary variations to accumulate and raise vision to a higher degree of perfection granted but while the insensible variation does not hinder the functioning of the eye neither does it help it so long as the variations that are complementary do not occur how in that case can the variation be retained by natural selection unwittingly one will reason as if the slight variation were a toothing stone set up by the organism and reserved for a later construction this hypothesis so little conformable to the darwinian principle is difficult enough to avoid even in the case of an organ which has been developed along one single main line of evolution for example the vertebrate eye but it is absolutely forced upon us when we observe the likeness of structure of the vertebrate eye and that of the mollusks how could the same small variations incalculable in number have ever occurred in the same order on two independent lines of evolution if they were purely accidental and how could they have been preserved by selection and accumulated in both cases the same in the same order when each of them taken separately was of no use let us turn then to the hypothesis of sudden variations and see whether it will solve the problem it certainly lessens the difficulty on one point but it makes it much worse on the other if the eye of the mollusk and that of the vertebrate have both been raised to their present form by a relatively small number of sudden leaps i have less difficulty in understanding the resemblance of the two organs than if this resemblance were due to an incalculable number of infinitesimal resemblances acquired successively in both cases it is chance that operates but in the second case chance is not required to work the miracle it would have to perform in the first not only is the number of resemblances to be added somewhat reduced but i can also understand better how each could be preserved and added to the others for the elementary variation is now considerable enough to be an advantage to the living being and so to lend itself to the play of selection but here there arises another problem no less formidable namely how do all the parts of the visual apparatus suddenly changed remain so well coordinated that the eye continues to exercise its function for the change of one part alone will make vision impossible unless this change is absolutely infinitesimal the parts must then all change at once each consulting the others i agree that a great number of uncoordinated variations may indeed have arisen in less fortunate individuals that natural selection may have eliminated these and that only the combination fit to endure capable of preserving and improving vision has survived still this combination had to be produced and supposing chance to have granted this favour once can we admit that it repeats the self-same favour in the course of the history of a species so as to give rise every time all at once to new complications marvellously regulated with reference to each other and so related to former complications as to go further on in the same direction how especially can we suppose that by a series of mere accidents these sudden variations occur the same in the same order involving in each case a perfect harmony of elements more and more numerous and complex along two independent lines of evolution the law of correlation will be invoked of course darwin himself appealed to it it will be alleged that a change is not localized in a single point of the organism but has its necessary recoil on other points the examples cited by darwin remain classic white cats with blue eyes are generally deaf hairless dogs have imperfect dentition etc granted but let us not play now on the word correlation a collective whole of solidary changes is one thing a system of complementary changes changes so coordinated as to keep up and even improve the functioning of an organ under more complicated conditions is another that an anomaly of the pilus system should be accompanied by an anomaly of dentition is quite conceivable without our having to call for a special principle of explanation for hair and teeth are similar formations and the same chemical change of the germ that hinders the formation of hair would probably obstruct that of teeth it may be for the same sort of reason that white cats with blue eyes are deaf 
in these different examples the correlative changes are only solidary changes not to mention the fact that they are really lesions namely diminutions or suppressions and not additions which makes a great difference but when we speak of correlative changes occurring suddenly in the different parts of the eye we use the word in an entirely new sense this time there is a whole set of changes not only simultaneous not only bound together by community of origin but so coordinated that the organ keeps on performing the same simple function and even performs it better that a change in the germ which influences the formation of the retina may affect at the same time also the formation of the cornea the iris the lens the visual centres etc i admit if necessary although they are formations that differ much more from one another in their original nature than do probably hair and teeth but that all these simultaneous changes should occur in such a way as to improve or even merely maintain vision this is what in the hypothesis of sudden variation i cannot admit unless a mysterious principle is to come in whose duty it is to watch over the interest of the function but this would be to give up the idea of accidental variation in reality these two senses of the word correlation are often interchanged in the mind of the biologist just like the two senses of the word adaptation and the confusion is almost legitimate in botany that science in which the theory of the formation of species by sudden variation rests on the firmest experimental basis in vegetables function is far less narrowly bound to form than in animals even profound morphological differences such as a change in the form of leaves have no appreciable influence on the exercise of function and so do not require a whole system of complementary changes for the plant to remain fit to survive but it is not so in the animal especially in the case of an organ like the eye a very complex structure and very delicate function here it is impossible to identify changes that are simply solidary with changes which are also complementary the two senses of the word correlation must be carefully distinguished it would be a downright paralogism to adopt one of them in the premises of the reasoning and the other in the conclusion and this is just what is done when the principle of correlation is invoked in explanations of detail in order to account for complementary variations and then correlation in general is spoken of as if it were any group of variations provoked by any variation of the germ thus the notion of correlation is first used in current science as it might be used by an advocate of finality it is understood that this is only a convenient way of expressing oneself that one will correct it and fall back on pure mechanism when explaining the nature of the principles and turning from science to philosophy and one does then come back to pure mechanism but only by giving a new meaning to the word correlation a meaning which would now make correlation inapplicable to the detail it is called upon to explain to sum up if the accidental variations that bring about evolution are insensible variations some good genius must be appealed to the genius of the future species in order to preserve and accumulate these variations for selection will not look after this if on the other hand the accidental variations are sudden then for the previous function to go on or for a new function to take its place all the changes that have happened together must be complementary so we have to fall back on the good genius again this time to obtain the convergence of simultaneous changes as before to be assured of the continuity of direction of successive variations but in neither case can parallel development of the same complex structures on independent lines of evolution be due to a mere accumulation of accidental variations so we come to the second of the two great hypotheses we have to examine suppose the variations are due not to accidental and inner causes but to the direct influence of outer circumstances let us see what line we should have to take on this hypothesis to account for the resemblance of eye structure in two series that are independent of each other from the phylogenetic point of view though mollusks and vertebrates have evolved separately both have remained exposed to the influence of light and light is a physical cause bringing forth certain definite effects acting in a continuous way it has been able to produce a continuous variation in a constant direction of course it is unlikely that the eye of the vertebrate and that of the mollusk have been built up by a series of variations due to simple chance admitting even that light enters into the case as an instrument of selection in order to allow only useful variations to persist there is no possibility that the play of chance even thus supervised from without should bring about in both cases the same juxtaposition of elements coordinated in the same way but it would be different supposing that light acted directly on the organized matter so as to change its structure and somehow adapt this structure to its own form the resemblance of the two effects would then be explained by the identity of the cause 
the more and more complex eye would be something like the deeper and deeper imprint of light on a matter which being organized possesses a special aptitude for receiving it but can an organic structure be likened to an imprint we have already called attention to the ambiguity of the term adaptation the gradual complication of a form which is being better and better adapted to the mould of outward circumstances is one thing the increasingly complex structure of an instrument which derives more and more advantage from these circumstances is another in the former case the matter merely receives an imprint in the second it reacts positively it solves a problem obviously it is this second sense of the word adapt that is used when one says that the eye has become better and better adapted to the influence of light but one passes more or less unconsciously from this sense to the other and a purely mechanistic biology will strive to make the passive adaptation of an inert matter which submits to the influence of its environment mean the same as the active adaptation of an organism which derives from this influence an advantage it can appropriate it must be owned indeed that nature herself appears to invite our mind to confuse these two types of adaptation for she usually begins by a passive adaptation where later on she will build up a mechanism for active response thus in the case before us it is unquestionable that the first rudiment of the eye is found in the pigment spot of the lower organisms this spot may indeed have been produced physically by the mere action of light and there are a great number of intermediaries between the simple spot of pigment and a complicated eye like that of the vertebrates but from the fact that we pass from one thing to another by degrees it does not follow that the two things are of the same nature from the fact that an orator falls in at first with the passions of his audience in order to make himself master of them it will not be concluded that to follow is the same as to lead now living matter seems to have no other means of turning circumstances to good account than by adapting itself to them passively at the outset where it has to direct a movement it begins by adopting it life proceeds by insinuation the intermediate degrees between a pigment spot and an eye are nothing to the point however numerous the degrees there will still be the same interval between the pigment spot and the eye as between a photograph and a photographic apparatus certainly the photograph has been gradually turned into a photographic apparatus but could light alone a physical force ever have provoked this change and converted an impression left by it into a machine capable of using it it may be claimed that considerations of utility are out of place here that the eye is not made to see but that we see because we have eyes that the organ is what it is and utility is a word by which we designate the functional effects of the structure but when i say that the eye makes use of light i do not merely mean that the eye is capable of seeing i allude to the very precise relations that exist between this organism and the apparatus of locomotion the retina of vertebrates is prolonged in an optic nerve which again is continued by cerebral centers connected with motor mechanisms our eye makes use of light in that it enables us to utilize by movements of reaction the objects that we see to be advantageous and to avoid those which we see to be injurious now of course as light may have produced a pigment spot by physical means so it can physically determine the movements of certain organisms ciliated infusoria for instance react to light but no one would hold that the influence of light has physically caused the formation of a nervous system of a muscular system of an osseous system all things which are continuous with the apparatus of vision in vertebrate animals the truth is when one speaks of the gradual formation of the eye and still more when one takes into account all that is inseparably connected with it one brings in something entirely different from the direct action of light one implicitly attributes to organized matter a certain capacity sui generis the mysterious power of building up very complicated machines to utilize the simple excitation that it undergoes but this is just what is claimed to be unnecessary physics and chemistry are said to give us the key to everything Imer's great work is instructive in this respect. It is well known what persevering effort this biologist has devoted to demonstrating that transformation is brought about by the influence of the external on the internal, continuously exerted in the same direction, and not, as Darwin held, by accidental variations. His theory rests on observations of the highest interest, of which the starting point was the study of the course followed by the colour variation of the skin in certain lizards before this the already old experiments of dorfmeister had shown that the same chrysalis according as it was submitted to cold or heat gave rise to very different butterflies which had long been regarded as independent species vanessa levana and vanessa prosa an intermediate temperature produces an intermediate form 
we might class with these facts the important transformations observed in a little crustacean artemia salina when the salt of the water it lives in is increased or diminished in these various experiments the external agent seems to act as a cause of transformation but what does the word cause mean here without undertaking an exhaustive analysis of the idea of causality we will merely remark that three very different meanings of this term are commonly confused a cause may act by impelling releasing or unwinding the billiard ball that strikes another determines its movement by impelling the spark that explodes the powder acts by releasing the gradual relaxing of the spring that makes the phonograph turn unwinds the melody inscribed on the cylinder if the melody which is played be the effect and the relaxing of the spring the cause we must say that the cause acts by unwinding what distinguishes these three cases from each other is the greater or less solidarity between the cause and the effect in the first the quantity and quality of the effect vary with the quantity and quality of the cause in the second neither quality nor quantity of the effect varies with quality and quantity of the cause the effect is invariable in the third the quantity of the effect depends on the quantity of the cause but the cause does not influence the quality of the effect the longer the cylinder turns by the action of the spring the more of the melody i shall hear but the nature of the melody or of the part heard does not depend on the action of the spring only in the first case really does cause explain effect in the others the effect is more or less given in advance and the antecedent invoked is in different degrees of course its occasion rather than its cause now in saying that the saltness of the water is the cause of the transformations of artemia or that the degree of temperature determines the colour and marks of the wings which a certain chrysalis will assume on becoming a butterfly is the word cause used in the first sense obviously not causality has here an intermediary sense between those of unwinding and releasing such indeed seems to be Imer's own meaning when he speaks of the kaleidoscopic character of the variation or when he says that the variation of organized matter works in a definite way just as inorganic matter crystallizes in definite directions and it may be granted perhaps that the process is a merely physical and chemical one in the case of the color changes of the skin but if this sort of explanation is extended to the case of the gradual formation of the eye of the vertebrate for instance it must be supposed that the physico-chemistry of living bodies is such that the influence of light has caused the organism to construct a progressive series of visual apparatus all extremely complex yet all capable of seeing and of seeing better and better what more could the most confirmed finalist say in order to mark out so exceptional a physico-chemistry and will not the position of a mechanistic philosophy become still more difficult when it is pointed out to it that the egg of a mollusk cannot have the same chemical composition as that of a vertebrate that the organic substance which evolved towards the first of these two forms could not have been chemically identical with that of the substance which went in the other direction and that nevertheless under the influence of light the same organ has been constructed in the one case as in the other the more we reflect upon it the more we shall see that this production of the same effect by two different accumulations of an enormous number of small causes is contrary to the principles of mechanistic philosophy we have concentrated the full force of our discussion upon an example drawn from phylogenesis but ontogenesis would have furnished us with facts no less cogent every moment right before our eyes nature arrives at identical results in sometimes neighboring species by entirely different embryogenic processes observations of heteroblastia have multiplied in late years and it has been necessary to reject the almost classical theory of the specificity of embryonic gills still keeping to our comparison between the eye of the vertebrates and that of mollusks we may point out that the retina of the vertebrate is produced by an expansion in the rudimentary brain of the young embryo it is a regular nervous center which has moved toward the periphery in the mollusk on the contrary the retina is derived from the ectoderm directly and not indirectly by means of the embryonic encephalon quite different therefore are the evolutionary processes which lead in man and in the pecten to the development of a like retina but without going so far as to compare two organisms so distant from each other we might reach the same conclusion simply by looking at certain very curious facts of regeneration in one and the same organism if the crystalline lens of a triton be removed it is regenerated by the iris now the original lens was built out of the ectoderm while the iris is of mesodermic origin what is more in the salamandra maculata if the lens be removed and the iris left 
the regeneration of the lens takes place at the upper part of the iris but if this upper part of the iris itself be taken away the regeneration takes place in the inner or retinal layer of the remaining region thus parts differently situated differently constituted meant normally for different functions are capable of performing the same duties and even of manufacturing when necessary the same pieces of the machine here we have indeed the same effect obtained by different combinations of causes whether we will or no we must appeal to some inner directing principle in order to account for this convergence of effects such convergence does not appear possible in the darwinian and especially the neo-darwinian theory of insensible accidental variations nor in the hypothesis of sudden accidental variations nor even in the theory that assigns definite directions to the evolution of the various organs by a kind of mechanical composition of the external with the internal forces so we come to the only one of the present forms of evolution which remains for us to mention namely neo-lamarckism End of section 3